Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Today's message is undeserved. Now, here's Pastor Carey. Praise God. Amen. Well, we are on the third week of our small groups. And those of you who are doing the small groups, how is it going? Um, I, I hope the topic is going well. I got a call. Actually, I called my mom, but she was about to call me. I, when I was in Montana, I left her one of our small groups books. And she was so impressed. <laughs> And um, I just, uh, I was like, well, at least someone loves it, and my mom does, but, uh, but, but praise God um, for that. Um, but uh, recognizing, you know, we're going through a, I, I, our small group on Wednesday night, it was pouring raining, I wasn't sure anybody was going to show up, but we had a really good group, and um, one, one of our first, uh, group people were saying, this is so so hard in some ways because dealing with the topic of love, it's not one that um, we recognize love comes from God and you see it in our nature. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that we are all challenged by. We are really challenged by it. But it's, um, it's obviously it's necessary. It's the core of who God is. So, Today we are talking about undeserving is the title. How we're undeserving of God's love. Uh, but he loves us anyways. So let us pray. Father, Lord, guide us now as we um, go through our, our lesson here. May your Holy Spirit um, enter this room. Enter into our hearts. Teach us uh, what we need to hear today. Guide us, show us while we are unworthy, but your love is, um, is so wonderful and powerful. And um, it shows, you, shows us who you, you are, shows, you, shows us the worthiness of what it is to worship you, Lord. So guide us now. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Um, we're going to go through Romans 5. And the first verse talks about, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Lord Jesus Christ. Something that um, you learn from this is you see what God is leading us to what what is important to us you know like we talk about the motive um, as in first corinthians 13 well all these great things we can do prophecy and and feed the poor and speak in tongues and all these things without love there's nothing right so it, it looks at we look at ourselves and we see what is our motive why do we do what what we do I mean, we could do all the good things, but it could be for very selfish motives, right? Um, we're, in a, some ways, it's kind of like your first date with, a, with your spouse-to-be or someone-to-be. You don't go up there and you, you, um, you dress up like a, you know, a slob, right? You put up your, you, you put your, Sunday's best, Sabbath's best, right? You look as nice as possible, right? You shave, right? And then you go and you, and you, um, you, you uh, start talking about all the good things that happen in your life. You don't go right on your first date and just unload all your issues, right? We don't recommend that, right? In the same way that, in, in some ways, though, 
trying to do all these good things for God is the same thing. It's like trying to make yourself look good in the presence of the Lord, right? And in reality, he sees all of us. He sees our issues. That first date is to someone who can seize all of you. And praise God, he loves you anyways, right? Right? Amen. Right. Um, so that's the mode of God. And then we, and the mode of, of ourselves. Um, and then we see that God, last week, we talk about the character of God. He is love. If you were to say one word, it, it, God is so many things. But if you were to pick one word to describe God, love would be certainly your best answer. And, um, but today, we're going to look... We're going to see a little bit about what God's motivation for us, or what, what should be our motivation. Yeah, what is our motivation, or his motivation for us. And here it says, therefore, since we have been justified. Justified is, what does that mean? It means, like, I, you know, I punched someone in the nose, right? Why did I punch him in the nose? Well, the guy was, you know, annoying me. So I could say I was justified for punching this person in the nose. Obviously, we teach our children that no one um, is justified to doing such a thing, right? You hear that all the time. Someone made me, you made me angry. That's why I did that. I've been justified by doing that, right? And we have to, we realize we are children as adults, acting like children do when they get, you know, something done to them, they, you know, hit back, right? But justified here, here in this context, says we have been justified. It's like this in the sense, we have been made right. How are we made made right? Through our faith. Not by anything that we've done. But we've been justified to the Lord in the presence of the Lord. You have been made right in the presence of the Lord, not by your wearing your best, showing pre yourself presentable, doing all the good things, but by our faith we have been justified, made right with the Lord. And why this is important here is that we see what God's priority for us is. One is he wants to restore us to make us right in the Lord. Think about your walk with God. What, sometimes you wonder, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? Oftentimes we, you know, we apply that. What job do you want me to do? What school do you want me to go to? Oh, what relationship do you want me to be in? This is what God wants you to be. God wants you to be right with the Lord. And whatever choices you make, make it that will help you be right with the Lord. Amen? Amen. So, that's Romans 5, 1. Romans 5, 2 says, Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Um, so, because by our faith we've been right with the Lord, we can stand in confidence. He uses the word boast here. By our faith, we can stand in confidence of the hope of the glory of God. What is the hope of the glory of God? Jesus coming in his glory, right? We have hope that when he comes, he is going to take us home, right? Amen? It's great to live with that hope. We can have anxiety about a lot of things, right? Anxiety whether we can pay our bills. Anxiety whether someone loves me or not. Anxiety whether your football team wins. There's a lot of things we can get anxiety about, right? Um, but eternal salvation is one we don't need that anxiety for. And that, to have that boast, that hope, 
to boast that hope for that hope, to have that confidence, what kind of impact does that have on our life? You know, to walk with the confidence, the hope, right? Um, so that's that part. And now in verse 3 through 4, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Per perseverance, character, and character, hope. So God is having this, doing this work in us. He was, he's making us right. We are justified by our faith. We have this hope in the glory of God, right? We can have this confidence. And in the time, and when we are in sufferings, struggling, in persecution, right, we can also have glory and have peace because it's producing something. It's producing perseverance. It's producing a change of character. And as we are becoming changed, becoming more like Christ and Jesus coming, taking us home. And we are ready. So, so that's the, the first part of Romans um, 5, 3, 4, 4. And then it gets to the parts where I, um, I want to stress in this. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know what this says? Like your hope for Jesus coming to take you home, you don't have to fear you looking foolish, right? Like a 10-year-old, you know, telling their school students, oh, you know, I still believe in Santa Claus. The hope in Santa Claus. I should be careful because... <laughs> <laughs> You get it, right? You understand. That's as far as my analogy goes on this. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the point of this is that you, you don't have to worry about, am I going the wrong way? Is my hope for nothing? Is my, my Christian journey the thing that I'm, 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 I'm value, I'm journeying on, I'm going through? Is this for not? Is this, what is, where is this leading me to? And, you know, all my friends, they're going this way. God, I'm following you, God, and it seems like I'm losing my friends, and I'm, you're telling me to go this way. You don't have to worry about looking foolish by following the Lord. Right? There is, um, and it says hope does not, does not put us to shame. And the, and the reality is, like, in the underlying of this is it's God's love. You know, like, he is leading you. Um, he is leading you in a place. And what, what is his motive? What is his desire for us? It's for us to be in his presence, to love us. That's where he's taking us. I kind of, you know, I have a little puppy now. I, I don't know if I mentioned that before. I think I have. She is so look, cute. Pain in the, you know, in the neck, right? <laughs> Chewing on everything, right? right? And it's just such a little puppy, and I'm so big and tall compared to her. And I have like a power, you know, for being the size that I am. And I look at her, and I have, I could put a fear in her when she does her business, where she's not supposed to, right? Or something. But I look at her, and I see her coming to me, and, you know, coming to me in my presence and just bowing down to me. And then with confidence, she comes up to me. I could smush her so easily. I wouldn't do that, right? But I could. But she puts her trust in me. 
and allows me to hold her. And, and she knows, you know, for she's, whatever I am going to do, whether put her in the cage or put her, whatever I'm going to do, she's willing, a willing per- participant in doing whatever I t- I'm going to do. Right? That is complete faith and hope in, and, and no, believing that the master is going to take care of her. That's how we are to be with God. He is our master, right? And we, you, you, you're like thinking, you know, what do we put our hope into? You know, I'm, I'm afraid of, of, of looking foolish. I remember early on in my Christian journey, uh, there was a book called The Jesus Freak came out, right? Do you remember that book? And I remember it's the book of martyrs, basically. And I remember asking myself, I do not want to be a Jesus freak, or telling myself that. I am not going to be a Jesus freak. It seemed like God was telling me to do all these crazy things, like, you know, get rid of all this stuff and do, you know, change and such. A, but I'm like, I don't want to be a Jesus. I didn't, I, was, I didn't trust where God was leading me towards. As Christians, let's have that hope and confidence that God is leading you to the place that is absolutely the best for us. That's the most for us, right? We have that hope, and we don't have to look foolish. Your friends may think you look, you're foolish. What? You do this? What? You tithe? You, what? This? You, you don't eat this? You don't watch this? What? You love this guy that was so mean to you, right? Right? All these, you forgive? I was really touched this week where um, a coach who lost his wife in a car accident, I don't know if you heard this story, a horrible story. Um, He has five children, and he was given his, the eulogy, and he was talking about how he, because the reason why he lost it was because a a guy went into the center median and um, crashed into a head-on collision with his wife. And he talked about forgiveness to the person who, um, who um, caused the accident, right? That doesn't, what? You doing that? Man, you need to hold a grudge, you know? An eye for an eye. Right? God has, you know, we put our hope in God's ways that may, the world may not seem to be, hey, that's the way we should do it. That's not what, that's not the way what goes down in the streets here. But his way, we, we put hope in. People don't understand it, but we put hope in that he is leading us to a road to a place that is best for us. Romans 5, 6. You see, this is where it comes in. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It's a, it is so important do not get into the trap. We can become like professional Christians. It's so important to not get into the trap that we're doing all these things to show favor with God. And because we do in all these, these things, he's going to love us. We can do that with people too, Right? You're trying to make someone love you, very sad stories of of a a child trying to make their father love them or a, a spouse trying to work so hard to try to make their spouse love them, right? And we kind of, in our own way, do the same thing with our relationship with God. As Christians, we have to get away from that trap 
to think that all these things that we are doing is to gain love from our God. Agape, the title of our series, Unconditional God, Love. That God loves you no matter what you do, right? You cannot escape God's love from you. So there's nothing you can't prove to, to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do. And it says here, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did Christ die for? The ungodly. Who's the ungodly? Sinners. Who are the sinners? You. Me. You. Not me. No, me. Pastor for 15 years. I am a sinner who Christ died, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm ungodly. Right? Why is this so important? Again, it's to understand God's love in this foolish. We so easily as Christians, or human nature, um, turn this around and, 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 and we do one good deed and another good deed and another good deed, and all of a sudden we're, we're, we're boasting in ourselves that we're maybe better than someone else. We're all children of God. We're all ungodly. Praise God for that. When we recognize that, we realize Christ died for us because of that. Um, verse 7 and 8 says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a state we need to be in. Otherwise, we, we lose the sense of humility. Otherwise, we, we get into the sense of a bit of self-righteousness. Because we understand the truth, we are God's children, God's chosen people. Right? And then we start to feel like we own God in a way. When God owns us, right? He owns all of us. And the, the, the brother who is on the street, you know, drug addict, God loves just as much as God loves me. Right? Right? So every day we come to our knees and we pray to God, thank you, Lord, for, for, for dying for me. For even though I don't, am not worthy, I don't deserve this. You see this kind of a, an interesting dialogue. God wants us to boast in his glory the hope of salvation. He wants us to have confidence that we are saved, right? But not boast in our salvation that we are all that because we are saved. Right? It's an interesting di dynamic because we need uh, to have our hope not on ourselves, of course, but on, on, on Christ Jesus who died for us. Why? Because he loved us. Right? We, we are the puppy and he picks up. He, we are the abandoned puppy who has no owner who he picks up and grabs and holds and loves and nurtures back to health and takes them home for eternity because he loves us. Nothing, no other reason than that because he loves us. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, but because of his great love for us, 
God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. Right? Okay, I know the argument is that means you can do whatever you want. There's always a but in all of this, right? That means go ahead and do whatever you, you can do whatever you want because God loves you. I already hear it in my groups, people, you know, saying the buts to all of this, right? God has a way, a better way for us. A way that will help us live a harmonious life, a life of peace, a life of love, a life of fullness, a life maximized by the reason why God created us in the first place when we follow his way. But it's not for us, for him to love us anymore. So even his way is not for him, it's for us. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? His way is not for him, it's for us. For how God tells us to not go in three o'clock in the morning and go drive the freeways drunk, right? Why? So we will be safe. So the people around us will be safe, right? It's for us. God loves us and he gives us a way. It's not like, you know, we need to do this, keep all these things and do all these things to, to show favor to God. He's going to love us no matter what. But that way is, again, it's not for us to show our love for him. He's done it for us. Um, and then when we do, right, because of his great love and mercy, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we were dead in transgression. What does that say? When we were dead, Christ resurrected. Just like Jesus resurrected from the grave, right? He resurrected us when we were dead. What part of us created this resurrection? None of us, right? So we try to resurrect ourselves by trying to do everything right. But what part of us created this resurrection? None of us. Only Christ did. Because he loves us. Why does he love us? It's, it, it, it's his nature, unconditional love for us. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more or love you less. And you look at ourselves and you compare yourself to God's love. His love is so awesome and amazing. And you look at yourself and you say, man, how I, what do I do with that love? I see I am so not worthy of this love. Right? I am so not worthy of this love. So undeserving of this love. But he loves me anyways. There's nothing else you need to do from this point on, right? That's just, just bask in that thought. You might think, oh, now I need to clean up my act. Because he loves me. That's the next, that's their initial reaction. You, now you need to clean up your act. No, stop there. Let him love you. And he will lead you the way you should go. Right? And the things you'll do is not for him. It'll be for, the, for your best, for you. Right? Next. Lastly. Is it last? No, a long ways to go. Good. Um, since we have now been justified, since we've been made right by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Um, you know, 
he's willing to do everything because he loves us. He sure wants us to avoid the, the consequences of our sinfulness. That's what this is. The wrath of God is really the consequences of our sinfulness. And he's saying, since he's made you right in the Lord, how much does he want you to be spared from his wrath, right? Praise God for that, right? You know, this laser could poke someone in the eye. I was saying that. Um, Romans 5.10 says, For if we, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You know, here's the beauty of this. God, you see his motivation for us. His motivation is for us to be justified. What does that mean? To be right with the Lord. To, be, to, to make it, to be right. Reconciled is, okay, Gustavo, you're in a fight with Victor. You guys are cat fighting. <laughs> right. And I say, it's time for you to reconcile, right? What does that mean? To restore the relationship, right? You see the motive that God wants for us. God, God's motive for us is he wants us to be right in the Lord, and he wants our relationship with God, with him to be reconciled. What is this all about anyways? Adam and Eve fallen, separated from God. Sin creates this chasm, distance between God and man. We can't see God. What is he trying to do? He's trying to bring us home. He's trying to reconcile the broken relationship that is there. And how does this happen? He sends his son to die for us, not because of anything we do, because he just loves us. And he wants to pick us up like that puppy and hold us and take us home. It's nice to know that we're loved. There's times in my life where I just thought no one loved me. I had this big pity party. You guys were all invited. No one showed up. But now we have this God. But I know, no matter what, I don't care if no one loves me. At least God loves me. Amen. Not at least. At God loves me. That's, that's, not, that's everything, right? Those of you that may struggle with self-esteem, just tell yourself, God loves you. That's all you need. That's all you need. In Romans 5.11, not only is it is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have been, who we have now reconciled, received recon reconciliation. All of this is created. How? Again, not by the things that we do. All of this understanding is revealed to us by this one notion. God is love. God loves us. That's how we understand this. We're studying this because God's unconditional love for us. And what does it do for us? It reveals all these things about us and about who God is and what his motive is to take us home, to restore our relationship with him. Let us pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for who you are. Father, you know each one in this room. You know what's going on in our minds, on our lives. You know the mistakes we've made. You know the problems that we have. You know the lack of faith that we have. You know all things. But you love us. And you always will. 
and nothing will keep us from you loving us. So what is the rest of this? It's just, you are revealing your love to us right now. And you're revealing to us where love is going, to restoring us to you, to take us home. Lord, please, help me to stop trying and just allowing you in, allowing your love into my heart. And may that love compel us, compel me to where to go to next. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.